Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and I'm going to ask you to imagine a scenario for this one. Imagine it's 1972. Imagine you've been invited to your friend's housewarming party. Everybody's ready to go with their bell bottoms when suddenly the phone rings. You find out that your friend's stereo system hasn't been delivered yet. Their separates in the cabinet with their 12 inch turntable on top isn't going to be available for the party. But you can save the day with your Sanyo Portable Stereo Solid State Music Center. Portable. So the Sanyo Portable Music Center features Stereo speakers built into the lid. Turntable, which may have seen better days, featuring 33, 45 and 78 RPM record player, a stereo tuner and a cassette deck. What more could you want? Okay, I might slightly sound like I'm poking fun at this, but I saw one of these featured on Techmoan a few months ago and just instantly went, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. If somebody did something like this today with a huge battery bank, a huge hard drive and some great speakers for a portable music kit you could take to a park or to the beach or something, I think a lot more people would be interested than would care to admit it. This is what you got in 1972, and I don't think this was the only or even the first model of these. I think there have been several previous to this. And they are great, actually. You could quite comfortably use this with the speakers that separate and actually come on little fly leads. You could have this set up at home and just be your all-in-one stereo system without too much trouble. Albeit, I don't feel like these are gonna be great speakers. So on the deck itself, you'll notice we have a battery bay and it takes about 45 pounds, and it doesn't matter if you're talking weight or currency of batteries to keep this running. And in my case, there's more than a little corrosion. And although it's switchable between 110, 220, and 240 volts, which is very specific considering the EU is now harmonized at 230 volts. On the inside of the battery cover, we have the model, a G2615N. And this will do multiple voltages, as we said, 50 or 60 hertz at 12 watts. Well, if the whole system is 12 watts, the speakers really aren't going to be kicking out much, are they? I love the fact you've got an analog gauge which will jump between mic level and battery level. It's a really good idea. Really simple little tell me how high the batteries are or tell me how high the uh, mic input levels are. And something you just don't see anymore an actual antenna. When did you last see one of those on anything? Like even cars, they're all built into the windows now. If you didn't know, that's why cars don't have aerials anymore because they're all just little traces around like one of the back windows or something. Oh, oh, that's its docked position. So it presses down to dock when it's closed and traveling, but pops up and rests on there when it's ready to play. Nice. So you've got recording volume for the tape deck, which has probably got belts that are all dead in it. Balance, pitch, tone, balance, function. So you can only have one thing playing at a time. That sounded really obvious. It wasn't meant to be. Um, meaning you can't mix the outputs for any reason. Yeah, all the functions you need to make this thing work. But what I really want to know is, what does this look like inside? Have they taken really a standard off-the-shelf tape deck, an off-the-shelf turntable, an off-the-shelf radio, put them in a case which makes them look slightly coherent, and then just sort of mix them together on this um, function knob? Or is this actually quite an integrated system? So, of course, the best way to find out is to have a look inside. being built in 1972 I feel like this is not going to be covered in glue there should be a lot of screws going on 
So if you were going to modify this into something modern, what features would you want on it? I think, I kind of feel like clearly it needs to have a Bluetooth speaker in there. Maybe if you wanted to go the whole hog and auxiliary in, the ability to output from a power bank to charge a device. Let me know what you would do over at the Element 14 community. If you can come up with some really good ideas, maybe we'll convince everybody to let us do this as a project. I think I've got most of the screws out. Oh, the whole thing's just gonna lift out. Brilliant. Should I take, can I take? See, normally either the entire head or the stylus comes out because it makes physical contact with the medium, they wear out. Uh, but, and this it doesn't seem to, and I don't know if that's just because I'm not spotting anything or whether it's broken, but I don't want to prematurely break it. Cool. Nice. So that's just, just one big empty case. So this is the back of the tuner, the radio receiver. This is the back of the tape deck, and this is the turntable and the batteries. What? I thought there were only three deep. You mean you've got to put like... Oh, wow, that's a lot of batteries. And this fell off the turntable too. Wow. That, right there, I'm gonna guess is the function knob. So that is just a really big stacked multi-pin selector. There's only three positions on this, radio, tape, and turntable, but look at the number of connectors going in and out of this thing. Wow, what a nightmare. I am interested by the turntable though, because it doesn't appear to have any belts. Does that mean it's direct drive? But then I don't know what this is. Oh. The speed selector's manual. It's like changing gears to change the record speed. The motor runs at a constant speed and then there's different sort of intermediate rollers or cogs or something that changes the speed of the turntable. Okay, anyway, let's think about this sensibly. Oh dear, I'm pretty sure that's not supposed to be broken. Sorry to say, the radio ferrite core here has seen better days. When I say seen better days, it's also been in fewer pieces. Right, so what we can say for sure at this point, AC input, voltage selector. So feeling quite comfortable that can come out. I have a feeling the transformers on nuts and they're spinning. So I'm gonna have to leave that until I can come back after I've got the turntable, at least the cover off. Take that spring off the center of the turntable. Hey, it's interesting this, turntables actually metallic and quite heavy and I think they were probably using that as a, like a flywheel to maintain the speed constantly it's not going to give you accuracy at hitting that 33 45 and 78 rpm speed but it will at least stay relatively constant meaning the music's not going to flutter all over the place and the pitch is going to warble up and down Oh, that's cool. So the speed selector has got the three positions at sort of the 12, four and eight positions. Uh, and in between, it's got these little blank notches and each one of these notches is like a standby position. And then as it moves up and down, this rubber wheel makes contact with a different diameter section of this post here. And then this rubber roller makes contact with this spindle, which is actually directly attached to the motor and the outside edge of the turntable. Really cool little way of doing speed control. I just love how much actual metal is in this thing. Like today, there would just be a load of plastic, two ICs and that'd be it. Ooh, okay. So this bit here is the bottom of the tone arm the bit that swings out and has the needle in it for the records. And it only has two cores. It doesn't even have anything attached to the metal post. And that tells me the record player is only mono. So although it's got stereo plastered all over this, it will only play records in mono. 
don't be fooled people so this big goofy looking thing here is uh, an auto stop so when this big flappy paddle on the tone arm swings around it will automatically open and stop the turntable running so really simple really cheap mechanical switch there I'm so upset about this ferrite core. Has anybody got any good advice on how I might be able to repair that? I suppose it only needs to be magnetically coupled. It doesn't need to be electron, like conductive. So maybe I could just glue that and it would be good enough. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. Okay, so there is a grounding screw in the corner here. I mean, designing something like this where the parts are all um, kind of together but kind of separate I mean they've got electrical interfaces which should mean they're galvanically isolated at the output side but they're pretty much always going to be powered together because the functions or maybe it does switch the power on the various functions It'd be a great way of extending battery life so maybe this switch is not just switching the audio outputs it's also switching the power output or input too that'd be interesting <laughs> so there's a little capacitor here between the sort of rail that all the switches mount onto. Going to the side of this on the cassette player, and you just see it's got this really long leg and this huge blob of solder on the side here. Like, I know soldering onto steel is hard, but I'm pretty sure I could have done it quicker and easier than that. So you see on here, the tuning actually moves this needle. Okay, so obviously the actual tuning is done by a potentiometer or something electrical, but making that needle move in a completely linear fashion from rotational input is actually kind of hard. Because if you think of the, the, the most immediate thing that comes to mind, it's normally like a linkage, if you imagine like a, a rotating drum with a fixed point on it and an arm that sort of pivots and follows. But that means the movement of that linear item is not linear. The movement is sinusoidal so it will move less towards the end of the stroke for the same amount of rotation and more at the middle of the stroke for the same amount of rotation wow i hope that makes sense um, <laughs> but that means that these needles that need to move linearly for every turn all the way along otherwise these the the markings on the dial would be well there would be a consequence of a sinusoidal wave and what you tend to find, or find in a lot of devices, certainly of this age, is what I think we're going to find in here, but I don't have a good way of getting it out yet. So aside from, again, this gorgeous hand layout of traces from the era, which I, I still find charming, frankly, you have the dial that sits roughly there. And you can see as I move this, I get a linear motion of that dial moving up and down. So for one turn, it always moves the same amount. And that's actuated by this tight little string wound around two posts, a pulley, and this big pulley at the top. Isn't that cool? It's a tightened string. And this is what actually changes the potentiometer at the center of this pulley that's altering the, um, the tuning. In fact, if we turn this over, we should see that right at the center here. So it's not potentiometer, is it? It's a variable, variable oscillator, is that right? Derek would be so disappointed in me. Sorry, Derek. So at the moment, this is coming out as one large chunk. And even the physical size of this makes me think it's a module from another device. I feel like this is me showing my age quite considerably. See, I can remember at school, um, we did a certain type of uh, maths teaching where it was all individual learning and you would do some cards which had certain questions in them or a set of a topic that you would have to learn about and then do some sums at the end to test yourself and you could learn at your own rate but every now and then it was about one in 20 of these self-teaching cards was a cassette tape and you got to sit in the corner with the headphones on and listening to a tape at your own pace to listen and the cassette tape players or the decks or whatever the correct term was were all about this size and in fact I, 
the buttons were all at the bottom as well and all you could do is plug headphones in but yeah they feel very much like this size and i would not be surprised if sanyo made their own one of those and this is a module from it and you can see how the, the plastics of the cassette loading mechanism sort of built into the front of this but actually the guts of this is very much a standalone module it has got an awful lot more wiring coming and going from it which is understandable because actually it's not just got power and playback this has got record as well so this has got to be able to take a signal from either the radio or the turntable to record this onto cassette so more wiring makes sense so i've just spent a little bit of time sort of poking around and digging about in here just trying to understand exactly what some of these ancillary PCBs actually do. I mean, this big board with the heatsink, clearly the amplifier, it's a stereo amplifier. You can see each channel is separately amplified and then yeah, that makes perfect sense. And let's just leave it at that for now. And that provides outputs for the speakers, albeit very poor 12 watt total consumption. It's not great amplification. I was a little bit confused by this daughter board here. Uh, it appears to take, have a couple of leads which go up to this mixing selector. But the giveaway is this light blue lead which runs down here to the microphone inputs so this is kind of a microphone preamp again a little bit like um i was saying earlier for the needle or the stylus on the record player microphones can give really low level inputs depending on what type they are they aren't the same as a line input so they need pre-amplification to get them to the same level as what will be the tape deck the radio that kind of stuff and then that can feed into the tape deck for recording at the same level as the radio would makes sense fair enough so i was a little bit confused why the stylus the the raw input from the vinyl comes all the way into this board because this is the input board that has the multi-tapping ac and the battery supply coming in but what they're doing on this board is they're actually giving it a slight amplification boost but they're also spitting the signal into faux stereo at this point so by the time it leaves here on this black lead it's actually already mocking stereo there's already two channels to it so they do that quite early on uh, and then the rest is all just line level exchange between tape deck between radio between all the other components and the amplifier ready to be output so it's really quite a separate device um i guess the weirdest thing is this amplifier board with sort of the remote circuits over here the remote potentiometers and controls over here and i think these modules probably are borrowed pinched from other other designed components because if you imagine this radio section with its nice little display but vertically upright sat in the front of a separate unit yeah i think that would fulfill sort of a four four inch high 19 inch rack mount style that is quite common Similarly, I think the tape deck I recognise from other formats. The amplifier doesn't have to be the same, but equally, if you showed me inside of a Sanyo unit from this time and there was a board exactly like that, I don't think I'd be surprised. Just because it's in a briefcase or a plastic case or metal separates or even wood grain, doesn't mean the electronics inside can't be the same thing. The only thing that is really annoying me at this point is this big pressed metal plate and it's actually joined on to a common terminal with this sort of phono preamp handling and it's got one lead soldered onto the edge of it and not a lot else. Don't think it's to do with grounding because of where it is in the machine. I don't think it's an antenna. It doesn't seem to have any relationship to the radio receiver. I don't know. Am I missing something on static discharge? Am I missing something on shielding? As always, the best way to correct me and set me right is to head over to element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. If you're watching this on YouTube, there's a link in the description that will take you right there. Put me out of my misery. Let me know what the answer is. It's really tough to know if this is disappointing that they've taken otherwise standard components and just sort of repackage them or whether actually that's a testament to how robust and clever some of these standalone components were that they could be reused like this multiple times in multiple instances and create a different product. I guess you get volumes of manufacture which really help the scale of economy and mean that you can produce this cheaper. I can't speak for the quality of what the final product was like because this wasn't a working unit but I would wager this was firmly, yeah, 
Again, if you think this would make a cool project to bring this up to date for the 21st century, let me know and we'll see if we can make it happen. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you next time.